There is an off-cited quote that a value is whatever someone is willing to pay. A more formal statement of this quote is often heard in legal cases, in which we think of value as the price that a well-informed and willing buyer and seller would be prepared to agree in an arm's length transaction. This first concept of value is the concept we invoke when we are trying to estimate the value of a non-traded asset. For example, we can observe the market value of a stock traded on the stock exchange. But if we are trying to estimate the market value for an unlisted asset, we need some estimate of value. It is the concept of value we think of when considering whether a takeover offer is fair and reasonable. It is the concept of value that realtors think of when they estimate value with reference to recent transactions. And it is the concept of value used in accounting for executive performance securities. An executive will often receive compensation in the form of securities in which the payoff is contingent upon the performance of the firm's shares or accounting-based metrics. Executive stock options is one example, but the payoffs can be structured in many different ways. For example, it could say receive a payout if the internal rate of return on the company's shares lies between 12% and 20%. The key point here is that we need to estimate the value of the non-traded security, the executive performance security, with reference to the market value of the traded security, the shares. The other concept of value is often called intrinsic value. It is a concept of value which is contingent upon the assumption that the market has mispriced the asset. To use the most prominent exponent of value-based investing, consider Warren Buffett. He will buy securities which he considers to be undervalued by the market in order to earn positive abnormal returns. An abnormal return is the return relative to what you would expect to earn given the risk of the security. The underlying assumption of value-based investing is that once the market alters its assumptions to those which the investor considers to be correct, the market price will shift towards intrinsic value. So prior to conducting any valuation exercise, you need to understand exactly what the task is. Are you being asked to estimate the market value of a non-traded asset? For example, are you being asked to value an initial public offering which is essentially asking what would the market pay for this unlisted security if it were traded today? Or are you being asked to estimate intrinsic value under the presumption that investors are overly optimistic or pessimistic, which presents an investment opportunity? For example, is your company considering a takeover offer for a listed company? You know the market value, but you need to make a bid based on how much additional value you can extract by taking control of the target. In corporate finance practice, we often see valuation exercises being performed inappropriately because this first obvious question has not been addressed. For example, an investment banker will estimate the acquisition price of a takeover target in part on the basis of traded shares of peer companies. An investment banker will generally compile valuations under a set of alternative estimation techniques and assumptions prior to reaching a conclusion on valuation. The problem is that often some of these techniques and assumptions are inappropriate for the task at hand. What is the point? We know what the market thinks of the prospects of the target company because we can observe the share price. And if we could simply examine price earnings ratios of peer companies to identify mispriced stocks, then earning positive abnormal returns in an investment portfolio would be relatively easy. What the banker needs to do in this situation is estimate what the market value will be once changes are made to the target under the control of the acquirer. With this primary question in mind, let's consider the two most widely used valuation concepts discounted cash flow valuation and multiples valuation. Both valuation techniques can be used to estimate the market value of a non-traded asset and both valuation techniques can be used to estimate intrinsic value. You will sometimes hear in corporate finance practice that discounted cash flow valuation should be used to estimate intrinsic value and multiples valuation should be used to estimate the market value of a non-traded asset. This is not correct. You can estimate the market value of a non-traded asset using a discounted cash flow valuation 
by incorporating contemporaneous market expectations for cash flows and risk into the valuation. And you can estimate intrinsic value using multiples by estimating the multiples the market applies on average to similar assets. So we have the first of our valuation rules. Intrinsic value is an assessment of value based upon what you consider normal or reasonable assumptions. Market value is the price in a transaction between a willing buyer and seller. You can estimate intrinsic value using discounted cash flows and valuation multiples if your assumptions are based upon what you consider normal or reasonable. You can estimate market value using discounted cash flows and valuation multiples, provided your assumptions reflect market expectations. Do not fall into the trap of assuming intrinsic value equals discounted cash flows and market value equals multiples. This one-for-one -one alignment between the concept of value and the method is not correct. How important is the detail? Details matter in valuation because the metrics we use for decision making are relatively crude. Valuations are highly sensitive to assumptions regarding discount rates and the drivers of cash flows. So in practice, we need to consider very carefully the details which have the most impact on the valuation. Often, valuations are distrusted by managers because of the sensitivity of value to assumptions. The implication of this is that managers start using other decision-making metrics to make an investment decision. As a specific example, a manager might distrust a discounted cash flow valuation, so instead looks to potential earnings per share growth as a metric. The limitation of this approach is that all the manager is really doing is changing the weight placed on different subsets of information. With reference to our example, the discounted cash flow valuation will already have incorporated all the information regarding earnings per share for all future periods. If the manager distrusts the discounted cash flow valuation and instead uses earnings per share growth as a metric, this is simply allocating more weight to near-term earnings per share and less weight to the risk associated with the investment in cash flows further in the future. As another example, maybe the manager looks to market share as a metric in order to achieve economies of scale. Again, any economies of scale realised from growing market share will be a subset of the information used in the discounted cash flow valuation. So if market share is given increased prominence, this is simply overweighting the importance of market share. It is like saying increased market share leads to higher cash flows, and a positive net present value project. And we also want increased market share for, insert your preferred reason here. The point is that a discounted cash flow valuation, if done correctly, can incorporate all value relevant information. So adding subsets of information as additional investment criteria results in double counting those subsets of information. So the details which underpin our valuations matter, and we need to pay careful attention to those details. But we should pay most attention to the details that have the most influence on value, not just what is easiest to count. A curious aspect of financial statements is that revenue will often be a single line item, but there will be a 20 line disaggregation of costs. While control over costs is important, there are constraints on how much a business can lower cost. The largest opportunities and risks for business relate to the revenue stream. Yet because costs are easier to measure and disaggregate than revenue, we seem to present financial statements with more disclosure about costs. The key point is to identify the most important drivers of value, understand the sensitivity of value to those drivers, and make an informed investment decision with respect to value. Finally, remember that implicit in valuation are assumptions regarding cash flows for all future periods. And we don't get to avoid making those assumptions simply because they might not be written down. Consider all the investment decisions being made in companies producing something 
that won't exist in its current form in a decade or two. Software, pharmaceutical products, communications technology. If we were to only value investments on the basis of what we can observe today, all these investments would be off the table. So even though we do not know exactly what software will be used in 20 years, or which drugs will be used to treat cancer, or what a phone or tablet will look like, we need to assume something about the future. We simply need to assume that there will be technological advances and account for that potential in our expectations for cash flows and risk. So continuing with our valuation rules, you cannot avoid making forecasts for all expected future cash flows. These can be explicit or implicit assumptions. But there is no computational trick that gets around the challenge of making your best estimates of expected future outcomes. Let's consider discounted cash flow valuation. We rely upon discounted cash flow valuations because they are transparent. You know exactly how much valuations change when you change any given assumption. They are theoretically sound. The only way to generate a long-term increase in share price is to take on projects expected to earn returns above their cost of funds. They have prominent use in corporate finance practice. For instance, in a survey of 392 chief financial officers in 1999, 75% of respondents stated that they always, or almost always, use net present value when deciding which projects or acquisitions to pursue. And discounted cash flow valuations appear to have a reasonable association with observed transaction prices. In an analysis of 51 leveraged buyouts from 1983 to 1989, researchers found that the transaction prices could be approximated with discounted cash flow valuations. The reason a subsample of leveraged buyouts was used for this task was a requirement of detailed disclosure of cash flow expectations in order to secure financing. In other data sets like analyst forecasts, cash flow and earnings expectations are only available for a small number of years. The basic concept of discounted cash flow valuation is that value is the present value of expected cash flows, discounted at a rate which reflects the risk of those cash flows. The term expected cash flows has a statistical definition. In statistics, an expectation is the average outcome from all possible outcomes. So in finance, the expected cash flows are the probability weighted average of all possible cash flows. For example, if there is a 60% chance that cash flows will be $100 and a 40% chance that cash flows will be $50, the expected cash flows are $80, computed as 0.6 times $100 plus 0.4 times $50 equals $60 plus $20 or $80. In the majority of applications, the difference between the expected cash flows and the most likely cash flows does not impact on the investment decision, because that decision is made on the basis of one scenario. But in some cases, it is very important, especially when there is a small chance of a large positive payoff. In this example, if you only consider the most likely scenario, the cash flows in your valuation will be materially below the expected cash flows, so value will be underestimated. With respect to the valuation of a project, division, or entire firm, we estimate the total cash flows generated by that entity. These cash flows are available for distribution to the providers of capital, normally equity holders and debt holders. The discount rate applied to those cash flows is a weighted average of the cost of funds from those providers of capital. And this is termed the weighted average cost of capital. With respect to equity valuation, we estimate the total cash flows distributed to equity holders and discount those cash flows at the cost of equity capital, often labelled RE. Most of the time, the cash flows distributed to equity holders will be in the form of dividends, but there can also be a return of capital. Earnings retained within the firm are not a cash flow to equity holders, nor is cash used to fund a share buyback. Shareholders still receive a return from these investments, and an investment in the firm's own shares is analogous to an investment in another business or project, 
but that return is in the form of capital gains. This means that if our task is to estimate the value of a share, we can take one of the following approaches. First, we can estimate the value of the entire firm, then subtract the value of debt to leave us with equity value, and then divide by the number of shares, and this is called the free cash flow approach. Or secondly, we can estimate the value of equity as the present value of expected distributions to equity holders, and this is called the dividend discount model approach. Recall the most basic equation from introductory finance and accounting courses, which states that the firm value, often labelled V, equals the value of equity, E, and debt, D. That is V equals D plus E. So if our task is to estimate E, and then estimate the per share value of equity by dividing by the number of shares, we can either estimate V minus D equals E, or just estimate E directly. Note that in estimating equity value, if there are changes in the number of shares on issue, you must estimate cash flows to equity holders on a per share basis. If you estimate total cash flows to equity holders, and if new shares are issued or repurchased at a price which is not equal to intrinsic value, your valuation will be incorrect. If the valuation is performed in a technically correct manner, the equity value will be exactly the same under the free cash flow approach and the dividend discount model approach. It won't be approximately the same. It will be identical. In some textbooks and in training provided by investment banks, you will read that some valuation approaches are useful for particular types of firms and other valuation approaches are useful for other types of firms. For example, you might read that the dividend discount model approach is useful for utilities because they pay high dividends, but that the free cash flow approach is better for technology firms because dividends are small or zero relative to the free cash flows. These statements are incorrect. It cannot be said that one valuation method is better than another when the two methods give you exactly the same answer. Are you more likely to win a football game scoring three touchdowns or kicking seven field goals? The reason the two discounted cash flow approaches will often give different answers in practice is because it can be challenging to implement the two approaches in an internally consistent manner. For example, an analyst might assume a steadily growing dividend but large and volatile earnings growth. Then the analyst might also have the earnings simply retained as cash, thereby earning low and safe returns, but discount those cash flows at the cost of equity, which is an inappropriate discount rate for risky investments. We can discuss some of these inconsistencies in the class, but for the moment, we just need to be clear that differences in valuation estimates from alternative discounted cash flow models result from technical issues relating to computations, and not because any particular discounted cash flow valuation is better or worse than another. So we have another valuation rule. Discounted cash flow valuations are transparent, theoretically sound, have prominent use in corporate finance practice, and have a reasonable association with observed transaction prices. The free cash flow to the firm approach and the dividend discount model approach are both discounted cash flow valuations and give the identical estimate of equity value if consistent assumptions are used with the two models. It is incorrect to say that one of the two models is better suited for a firm based upon firm characteristics like industry. You can't say that one answer is better than another identical answer. Your choice as to whether to rely upon the free cash flow approach or the dividend discount model approach is therefore based upon which approach is most convenient given the information available to you. We'll illustrate discounted cash flow valuation with reference to Kellogg Company, which is a manufacturer and marketer of convenience foods. Kellogg is a listed company, so we already know what the market value of the equity in Kellogg is. 
based upon the share price and the value of the whole firm, equity value plus debt. But we can still illustrate our valuation process using a listed company. Using a listed company makes the example easier than using a private company because there is a large amount of publicly available information for listed companies that we can use to make assumptions. The valuation of a private company follows the same process, but often with a discount for illiquidity. The information presented in Table 1 will be used in our example. The forecast information is an approximation of analyst expectations and assumptions. I made about investments in working capital, working capital as current assets less current liabilities, and capital expenditure needed to make, maintain zero growth. We refer to this zero growth capital expenditure later as sustaining capital expenditure. Let's talk about cash flows and discount rates. Getting down to specifics regarding discounted cash flow valuation, recall that value can be estimated as the present value of expected cash flows and not earnings. Earnings are useful for performance measurement. The reason we measure performance using accrual accounting is to allocate the timing of cash flows to an appropriate period. Depreciation is the allocation of capital investment over the period the investment is expected to generate economic benefits. Pension expenses are an accounting-based estimate of the costs associated with the promise of future cash flows to retired employees. What we care about for valuation is the timing of expected cash flows and the risks associated with those cash flows. Our equation for the value of a firm, V, is given below, in which the free cash flow to the firm, written as FCFF, represents the free cash flow to the firm in year T, and WAC, or WACC, is the weighted average cost of capital. Note that we use the term value of the firm, even though this valuation equation applies equally to the value of a division or the value of a project. It is just convenient to refer to the firm to distinguish the value to equity holders only. We will estimate the present value of all cash flows distributed to equity holders and to debt holders. The valuation equation is the particular case in which the contribution of debt and equity capital to the firm or project's finances is assumed to remain constant. In other words, we have assumed a constant capital structure. It is important to ensure that cash flow projections are also based upon this same assumed constant capital structure. Otherwise, there will be an inconsistency between the cash flow and discount rate assumptions, and this could lead to over or under valuation. A more general equation is as follows, in which the discount rate could vary over time according to different capital structures. The only difference is that in the denominator, we have the product of one plus the weighted average cost of capital for relevant periods, rather than one plus the weighted average cost of capital to the power of t, in which the weighted average cost of capital is constant. As an example, suppose you thought the cost of capital should be 9% in year one and 8% in year two. If the expected cash flow in year two was $100, the present value of the year two cash flow would be $84.95. That is $100 divided by 1.08 times 1.09 would be $84. And 95 cents. Given the above equations, we need to define the cash flows and discount rates. In Table 2, I present consistent definitions of cash flows and discount rates that, if implemented in a technically correct manner, will lead to an identical valuation. The difference in the equations relates to the treatment of the tax benefits of debt. In the first cash flow and discount rate equations, the tax benefits of debt are incorporated into the discount rate. The cost of capital is lowered by multiplying the cost of debt, that is RD, times one minus the corporate tax rate. This is sometimes referred to as unlevered cash flows. In the second disc cash flow discount rate equations, the tax benefits of debt are incorporated into the cash flows by adding interest expense multiplied by the corporate tax rate. But there are no tax benefits associated with the discount rate. 
The key point is that in estimating cash flows and a corresponding discount rate, we need to incorporate any tax benefits of debt once, either by lowering the discount rate, as in the first case, or by increasing the cash flows, as in the second case. Consider the cash flow definition in more detail. Our objective is to take a measure of earnings and estimate the cash flows to be distributed to the providers of capital. So we start with after-tax operational earnings, that is EBIT times one minus the tax rate. Then we want to do two things. First, we want to add back any accounting items that do not represent cash flows. The most prominent instance is depreciation. This is an account expense that lowered EBIT, but we did not need to pay any cash associated with the depreciation. So we add back depreciation, which increases cash flows. This concept applies equally to any other accounting item that does not represent cash flows. But I present the equation just using depreciation because it's the most obvious case. Second, we want to take away any cash flow item that did not flow through the income statement. The most prominent example is capital expenditure. Capital expenditure represents cash not distributed to the providers of capital and also was not captured by the income statement. Again, there can be other cash flow items that did not flow through the income statement and I have just used capital expenditure in the equation because it is the most obvious example. Let's move on to the cost of capital. We're going to use nominal cash flows and a nominal discount rate in our valuation. And I make this recommendation because we need to get our cash flows correct. It may be useful to present forecast to managers in real terms after the valuation is complete because they have a conceptual understanding of what real dollars can buy today. But you are likely to mitigate the risk of valuation errors if you compile your analysis in nominal terms for the following reason. It is correct to say that discounting real cash flows at a real discount rate will result in the same present value calculation as discounting nominal cash flows at a nominal discount rate. But it is difficult to conceive of a situation in which the real cash flows can be projected without first projecting the nominal cash flows. In two decades of study, research and practice, I have never encountered one. And the reason for this is that taxes are estimated on the basis of nominal accounting numbers. So to estimate taxes, you need to project earnings and cash flows in nominal terms. And if you are gonna perform this computation anyway, you may as well perform the valuation using a nominal discount rate. The only reason to present figures in real terms is that managers have benchmarks in their heads according to today's prices. So it is useful for them to consider projected figures on a real basis. But this presentational adjustment can be made after the valuation is performed. There is no reason to convert real cash flows in advance of the valuation. So let's consider another of our valuation rules. You must use the nominal discount rate and the nominal cash flows for valuation. Otherwise, your estimate of tax will be incorrect. You can project cash flows in real terms, but they must be converted to nominal terms prior to computing estimates of free cash flow. Let's consider briefly the cost of capital. The most important issue in determining the discount rate is to remember that the discount rate should reflect the risk of the particular cash flow stream being discounted. As a practical manner, we generally estimate discount rates with respect to data available for listed firms. So we need to determine how to convert discount rate estimates for listed firms to discount rates for estimates for projects within a firm. The cost of capital should reflect the risk of the division or project and not the cost of capital for a diversified firm. However, sometimes corporations impose a firm-wide cost of capital across all divisions. And there's an important management reason for this. It removes the incentive for a divisional or project manager to attempt to make that manager's preferred project appear to be of higher value 
by arguing for a lower discount rate. With the discount rate discussion off the table, the argument will focus on the level and risk of expected cash flows. So as one of our valuation rules, we will say, the cost of capital for a divisional project must reflect the risk of that divisional project, not the risk of the owner of the asset. Some corporations correctly make the assumption that divisions of projects should be evaluated using the same discount rate because it is hard to measure the difference between risks and therefore discount rates. The capital asset pricing model was developed around 50 years ago as a theory of expected returns. The capital asset pricing model says that the expected return on a risky asset is the sum of the risk-free rate of interest and a premium for bearing systematic risk, also termed market risk or economic risk. The systematic risk premium is the product of the market risk premium, the expected return on the market for all risky assets above the risk-free rate. The expected return and beta are specific to asset I and the expected market return and risk-free rate are market-wide parameters. The capital asset pricing model was developed under the assumptions of a perfect capital market, which means there are no impediments to trade like taxes, transaction costs or information asymmetry. That's difference, differences in information amongst investors. Under these assumptions, the only risk that will be priced by the market, that is the only risk incorporated into market prices, will be systematic risk. Because investors are able to hold well diversified portfolios, which eliminates their exposure to the risks of individual assets. In simple terms, Diversification means that the unexpected positive returns on one asset will be offset by the unexpected negative returns on another asset. In reality though, the assumptions of a perfect capital market are violated, which leaves open the possibility for other risk exposures to be incorporated into market prices. There is the potential for risks associated with illiquidity, default risk or other asset specific risks to factor into expected returns, even if there is no consensus amongst academics about just what risks are indeed factored into expected returns. The capital asset pricing model is not the only equation that can be used to estimate the cost of equity. I merely introduce it here to convey the idea that the cost of capital reflects risk. And one concept of risk that is relevant is systematic risk. In the lecture relating to the cost of capital, we will discuss alternatives to the capital asset pricing model and have a more detailed discussion of specific estimation issues relating to each parameter input into the CAPM and other asset pricing models. So here's another valuation rule. The capital asset pricing model is one of several ways to estimate the cost of equity. It does not work very well a topic covered in later modules, but it is a useful starting point for thinking about diversification and systematic risk. The model is incomplete because it ignores other risks that we know are reflected in asset prices. So that's the model for estimating the cost of equity. What about estimating the cost of debt, also called the cost of fixed income securities? We need to make a distinction between the yield to maturity on debt and the expected return on debt. The expected return on debt is lower than the yield because there is some probability of default. The yield to maturity is the return the debt holders will receive in the absence of default, assuming coupon payments can be reinvested at the same yield, which also implicitly assumes no interest rate fluctuations. In contrast, the expected return is a probability weighted average of all possible returns. In the simplest case, it is the weighted average of the yield to maturity and the return we would expect in the event of default. So for example, if the yield to maturity was 8%, the probability of default was 2%, and investors expect to lose 50% in the event of default, the expected return is the probability of no default times the expected return if there is no default, plus the probability of default times the expected return if default happens. 
in this case, our computation is 0.98 times 8%, plus 0.02 times minus 50%, which is 7.84% minus 1% or 6.84%. So which do we use? For estimating the weighted average cost of capital in investment decision making, you should still use the yield to maturity as your estimate of the cost of debt. The reason for this is that the scenario you present to investors or the board will have cash flows defined under the assumption that lenders are repaid. So the investment needs to generate enough returns to shareholders in this normal scenario, such that those shareholders are able to earn their cost of equity capital. If you perform your valuation using the lower weighted average cost of capital, derived from the expected return on debt, you could find yourself recommending an investment on the basis that it has a sufficiently high probability of default that it is worthwhile to equity holders. And this is unlikely to be met with acceptance from those investors. So as one of our valuation rules, we will say that you must use the yield to maturity on debt and not the expected return on debt in estimating the weighted average cost of capital. The reason for this rule is that the cash flows typically used in valuation are based upon a no default scenario. So the discount rate should reflect this no default scenario. Let's consider our application. In our Kellogg case, we have the following inputs into the cost of capital. A risk free rate of 1.7%, the yield to maturity on 10 year US government bonds during August 2019 was on average 1.7%, a market risk premium of 6%, and this is an estimate of the market risk premium for US listed stocks in August 2019 based upon past stock returns and current indicators of market risk, that is stock prices, corporate bond prices, government bond prices and market volatility for stocks listed in the US, and an equity risk premium specific to Kellogg of 5%. That's my assumption for the purposes of the example. Finally, I'm going to assume a yield to maturity on debt of 2.5% because in August 2019, corporate debt in the US was offering a yield to maturity of 2.5%. I haven't used the capital asset pricing model because nothing we cover in this example requires us to use the capital asset pricing model. And I don't want to convey the notion that you must use the capital asset pricing model to estimate the cost of equity. I've used an equity risk premium of 5% for Kellogg because Kellogg is a large company and on average large companies are less risky than small companies and has a low book to market ratio. We know that on average companies with a high book to market ratio are more risky than companies with a low book to market ratio. The book to market ratio is the ratio of book value of equity from the balance sheet to the market value of equity. Market value of equity is share price multiplied by the number of shares in issue. So we will adopt a cost of equity of 6.7%. That is the risk free rate of 1.7% plus an equity risk premium of 5% is 6.7% and a cost of debt of 2.5%. We will also assume a corporate tax rate of 20%. This is consistent with analyst expectations for tax expense relative to pre-tax profit. For computing the weighted average cost of capital, we need an estimate of leverage. That is the proportion of firm or asset market value financed by debt. You'll see later that we will revise this initial leverage estimate at the end of the valuation computation. And this revision to the leverage estimate is crucial. In this case, I will assume an initial leverage estimate of 31% based upon analysis of seven listed companies with similar businesses. Leverage is computed as total debt divided by total debt plus market value of equity for the following companies. Kraft Heinz, Treehouse Foods, Mondelo's International, General Mills, Post Holdings, Campbell Soup and Otogi. This implies a weighted average cost of capital of 5.2%. There are two subtle but important differences to note about the use of the weighted average cost of capital in practice. First, Note that we have used to yield, the yield to maturity on debt in the weighted average cost of capital rather than the expected return on debt. As mentioned earlier, the expected return on debt is lower than the yield 
because there is some probability that the firm will default, but no probability that the firm, the debt holders will receive extra cash flows. In a strictly technical sense, we could advocate for use of the expected return on debt in capital budgeting, but the problem with that approach is that you could end up with a situation in which a project is NPV positive, and so you advocate to accept the project, but in almost all circumstances, the equity holders do not receive their required return. Most business cases are made on the basis of scenarios. So you could end up presenting the majority of scenarios to the board in which the equity holders earn below par returns, and the project only appears to be a good investment because of the high default risk. And I don't think that makes a lot of sense. The key point is that if a project is NPV positive when you use the expected return in the weighted average cost of capital, but NPV negative when you use the yield to maturity, it is such a marginal project that it should probably be put on hold until a way can be found to improve its economics. Second, while we have an initial estimate of leverage, this estimate is probably going to be revised at a later stage to be consistent with our final valuation. The purpose of the exercise is to value the project. We need an estimate of leverage to estimate the weighted average cost of capital, which requires an estimate of value for equity and debt. So there is a circularity here that we break by using an initial estimate of leverage based upon comparable firms. But at the end of the process, it is essential that the leverage in our weighted average cost of capital is consistent with the final values for equity and debt. Otherwise, we could materially misstate the value of equity and the value of the firm or project. Once we complete the valuation exercise, you will see that the circularity can be resolved in a matter of seconds. So it won't matter what input we use for initial leverage, it will ultimately be revised to the correct level. Importantly, never use the book value of equity as a proxy for market value of equity. The book value of equity can be markedly different from the market value of equity due to accounting principles that, for the most part, do not incorporate market values into balance sheets. So using book value leverage will lead to material valuation errors. So here's one of our valuation rules. There must be the same ratio of debt to equity in the weighted average cost of capital that you end up with at the end of the process. For example, if you end up with debt of $50, equity of $100, and therefore firm value of $150, then the leverage ratio in the weighted average cost of capital must be $50 on $150 or 33%. You can never use the equity figure in the balance sheet to estimate leverage for the cost of capital calculation. It is an irrelevant figure for valuation. Equity in the balance sheet is, in some circumstances, is a proxy for the amount of equity that has been invested in the business but you cannot use it as a proxy for the market value of equity. Let's turn to estimation of long-term growth. A net present value computation requires us to estimate expected cash flows for the entire life of the project. In some instances, project life might be explicitly defined. For example, if a mine was reaching the end of its life. In other instances, project life could be ambiguous. The mine life could be a predictable number of years based upon nine reserves, but it could be extended if additional reserves can be found, or if resources can be made economic with improvements in technology. We can extend this further to the assumption that the project continues indefinitely, which is the most common assumption made in valuation of non-resource projects. We even value firms with individual projects with finite lives, under the assumption that the firm itself continues indefinitely. For instance, a pharmaceutical company has a drug with a 20-year patent, after which revenues will fall dramatically due to competition from generic competitors.
but we still value the pharmaceutical company under the assumption that its research or acquisition activities will lead to a revenue stream from somewhere. The same applies to valuing a technology company. We don't know what device we will use for communications in 20 years, but chances are the existing smartphones will be obsolete. So we need to decide whether a technology company will run out of ideas and be surpassed by a better technology company. Or assume that the incumbent firm will continue to produce communication devices, despite not being able to predict what those devices will be. Given the need to project cash flows for an extended period of time, a convenient way of incorporating this assumption in valuation is to assume constant growth of those cash flows. It is convenient, but not essential, to assume constant growth for this task. To reiterate, we do not need to assume constant growth. Given the ready availability of software like spreadsheets for valuation, we can project individual cash flows for a couple of hundred years, after which the present value of those cash flows is approximately zero. Sometimes people object to projecting individual cash flows past a handful of forecast years because we don't know what those cash flows are. But we aren't projecting cash flows with, with certainty. We are projecting expected cash flows, the average cash flows from possible outcomes, or a scenario as a proxy for those expected cash flows. The most important issue though, is that when we use a long-term growth rate, we are making an implicit assumption about the cash flows in each individual forecast year. We just aren't writing down the explicit forecasts. For instance, if we assume $100 of cash flows next year and long-term growth of 6%, we are making an implicit assumption that expected cash flows 10 years later is $179, and in 20 years will be $321. After all, $100 times 1.06 to the power of 10 is 179, and $100 times 1.06 to the power of 20 is $321. So making an assumption about long-term growth doesn't reduce the number of assumptions we need to make. It is just a convenient way of making those assumptions. Constant growth is also not the only way to project a series of long-term cash flows. There are equations we can use to estimate declining growth at a constant rate or periods of different growth rates, and we will consider one of these alternative equations later. Under the assumption of long-term growth in cash flows, we have the following equation for the terminal value. The terminal value is an estimate of the value of the firm or project at the end of the explicit forecast period, the period in which you make individual cash flow forecasts. If we incorporate our equation for the terminal value into our valuation equation with n years in the explicit forecast period, we have the equation which is shown on the screen. How do we determine what growth rate is appropriate? First, we need to remember that this is a long-term growth rate. So we need to project individual cash flows to the period in which the firm or project is expected to be in steady state. For instance, if we were to value a mining project, which should project individual cash flows to the point at which our assumptions regarding commodity prices, exchange rates and interest rates are at assumed long-term values. If we were to value a retail business, we should project individual cash flows to the point at which the profit margins are sustainable. Margins too low will drive competitors out of the industry. Margins too high will encourage competition. When the firm or project is growing at a constant rate, it means that each component of the income statement will grow at that rate. Otherwise, margins will not be constant. This means that the growth rate for sales, operating costs, depreciation, interest and taxes will all be the same. Second, it is not necessarily the case that growth will be the same as the growth rate in the overall economy. Sometimes we read that if the growth rate for a firm is higher than the growth rate for gross domestic product or GDP, 
the firm will eventually be larger than the economy, so this isn't possible. But the assets in the economy have a large proportion of very low growth assets. And if we were to apply this rule, we would need to be very strict about only adopting a constant growth assumption when we were certain that the firm couldn't increase its presence in the economy. We would basically need to project cash flows for 100 years, which would defeat the purpose of the exercise of making a long-term growth assumption. To make this point even more clear, note that long-term average real GDP growth rates in the United States and Australia are approximately the same, about 3% per year as a long-term average. And long-term average inflation has been approximately the same in both countries, about 3% per year, although it's closer to 1% or 2% in 2019. The United States and Australian central banks have both adopted a policy in recent decades of maintaining inflation at moderate levels. Since the introduction of this policy by central banks, we have, have observed the following gross domestic product growth rates and inflation rates. In the US from 1981 to 2013, GDP growth was 2.9% per year and inflation was 2.9% per year. In Australia, from 1990 to 2013, GDP growth rate was 3.4% per year and inflation has been 2.7% per year. So growth rates are about the same in the two countries, inflation's about the same in the two countries, and historical average equity market returns have also been about the same, about 12% per year. From 1927 to 2012, the annual average US equity market return, as reported by Professor Ken French, was 11.6%. From 1883 to 2010, the average annual Australian equity market return, as reported by Brailsford, Hanley and Maris Warren, was 11.8%. Yet, US listed companies trade on considerably higher valuation multiples than Australian listed companies. So the US market incorporates higher growth expectations than the Australian market. From 1982 to 2013, the median price earnings multiple for US listed stocks was 21.1. From 1991 to 2013, the median price earnings multiple for Australian listed stocks was 19.8. This occurs because US listed companies reinvest a higher proportion of earnings. But Australian listed companies pay higher dividends due to differences in tax systems. If you were to assume long-term growth rates in your company forecasts on the basis of GDP growth, you would assume the same growth rate for similar firms in both countries, despite the clear differences in the reinvestment rates of the listed companies in those countries. Third, we need to consider both reinvestment rates and returns on investment in estimating a growth rate. In fact, we have an explicit formula for this, which states that growth is the product of the reinvestment rate and the expected return on reinvested capital. The equation is shown on the screen. To estimate the reinvestment rate, we need to determine how much cash is available for distribution to equity and debt holders after enough cash has been invested to maintain the existing assets. Then we need to est estimate how much of this available cash is reinvested for growth by spending on fixed assets and working capital. The ratio of the capital expenditure on new investments plus spending on working capital to the cash available after maintaining the assets is the reinvestment rate, as shown in the equation below. The equation also shows that total capital expenditure can be split into capital needed to maintain the assets in a zero growth state and capital needed for growth. A reasonable proxy for capital needed to maintain assets is depreciation. After all, depreciation is intended to be a measure of the decline in the economic value of the assets. In some instances, depreciation might not be a particularly good proxy for change in economic value, 
But this is just because accounting rules and conventions need to be applied to all firms. And in some cases, those rules and conventions aren't particularly suited for the individual case. Importantly, if you assume that capital spending is equal to depreciation, this implies zero growth. It does not imply that growth will be equal to inflation. In some cases, analysts use the projected inflation rate as a floor for the long-term growth rate, even if no cash is put back into the business above the projected depreciation. But this is a mistake. The business needs to spend more on capital than depreciation just to grow at the inflation rate, because each year that expenditure buys a little bit less in maintenance. Inflation means that it costs more each year to refurbish machines and paint the walls and lay new carpet and so on. So if the business spends the same nominal amount each year, it will buy less quality machines and paint the walls less often and lay new carpet less often. So real growth will decline and nominal growth will be zero. The second part of our equation is the return on reinvested capital. It is challenging to project a return on reinvested capital, which is one reason why analysts often use a single long-term growth rate instead of decomposing the growth into a reinvestment rate and a return. However, recall the earlier comment about implicit and explicit assumptions. If you make a single estimate of long-term growth, you are necessarily making an implicit assumption about the return on reinvested capital. Your cash flow projections in the last year of the explicit forecast period necessarily imply a reinvestment rate. So whatever assumption you make for long-term growth will imply an assumption about return on investment. Just like assuming a long-term growth rate does not allow you to avoid making assumptions about cash flows in each individual forecast year, you are not able to avoid making an assumption about the return on investment. The return on investment should exceed your estimate of the cost of capital. This is an issue of considerable debate because an economist could argue that in a competitive market, on average, we should expect investments to earn their cost of funds. But the market has the final say on this issue and market prices incorporate an assumption that investments earn returns above their cost of funds. This can be illustrated with a simple example. For equity valuation, as opposed to firm valuation, the reinvestment rate is the proportion of earnings per share that is reinvested rather than being distributed as a dividend. In other words, the reinvestment rate for equity is one minus the dividend payout ratio. This is illustrated in table three, which shows the growth and reinvestment rate equations for the firm alongside the growth and reinvestment rate equations for equity. The growth rates will be the same using the two equations, but the breakdown of the reinvestment rates and returns is different. If we were to value a share of stock as the present value of expected future dividends and assume constant growth in those dividends, we would have the following equation. This is referred to as a constant growth dividend discount model. It says that share price is equal to next period's dividend divided by the cost of equity minus the growth rate. The growth rate for equity is the expected return on reinvested equity, which we can write as E outside of ROE. And the reinvestment rate is one minus the first year dividends per share divided by first year earnings per share. So under constant growth, we have the following valuation equation for the stock. It's shown on the screen. According to this equation, the share price will be higher if the expected return on equity is higher and if the dividend payout ratio is lower. If you make the further assumption that the cost of equity is equal to the expected return on equity, that is if you assume that RE equals E outside of ROE, the valuation equation collapses to the following equation. It says that share price equals first year earnings per share divided by the cost of equity. Given the equation above, which states that if investments earn their cost of funds, the share price is equal to earnings per share divided by the cost of equity, does the market value X shares 
as if it expects investments just to earn their cost of funds? No. If you divided both sides of the equation by earnings per share, the implication is that the price earnings ratio is equal to the inverse of the cost of equity. That is the PE ratio would be one on RE. On average, the market has priced shares at approximately 15 times forecast earnings. In the five years ending August 27, 2019, the average ratio of price to first year earnings has been 16.8 in the US. So if the market priced shares on the basis that investments earn their cost of capital, the cost of equity would be just 5.9% in nominal terms and around 4.3% in real terms, given current inflation expectations of about 1.6%. The 1.6% percent figure comes from the difference in yield between 10-year government bonds and the 10-year yields on inflation protected securities. The relationship between real returns and nominal returns is given by the equation 1 plus the nominal return equals 1 plus the real return times 1 plus inflation minus 1. Yet in real terms, the historical average market return on the US equity market was 8.5% from January 1872 to July 2015, 8.1% from August 1970 to August 2019, and 6% from August 1997 to August 2019. In short, if the market price stocks under the assumption that companies' investments are liable to earn a return only equal to the cost of capital, the projected real equity return would be around about 4.3%. That is well below historical average returns of 6% in the last 22 years and 8.1% in the last 49 years. It is therefore likely that the market actually prices stocks under the assumption that investments will earn returns above the cost of capital. In a research paper, we estimated the cost of equity capital in the United States from 1999 to 2008 at 10% and the expected return on equity at 20% for those companies. How could this occur where investments earn returns above the cost of capital? There's three reasons. First, there is imperfect competition, which leaves open the possibility that companies on average do make positive net present value investments. The economist notion that abnormal returns on investments are eroded to zero holds under perfect competition. Second, executives exhibit a heightened degree of risk aversion in making investments because they bear asymmetric costs of investments, which in hindsight are negative net present value projects. We evaluate executives on outcomes and the consequences of failed investments are more obvious than the consequences of good investments. So executives impose hurdle rates above the cost of capital. They do not continue to accept ever more marginal projects until abnormal returns are eroded. Third, accounting standards and conventions are based upon conservative accounting principles, which leads to some expenditures being classified as expenses when in substance they are investments. For example, research and development for technology and healthcare firms. This means that what is classified as capital expenditure is decreased, and therefore the return on capital is increased. So even if there was perfect competition that eroded abnormal returns on investment, meaning growth is normal, the reinvestment rate is understated, and the return on investment is overstated. If you take the reinvestment rate as given, assuming that all expenses are not investments, and also assume that those investments earn just their cost of capital, you will underestimate the likely growth rate. In estimating growth, you need to consider growth from two directions, which I label as top-down and bottom-up. The top-down directional estimate requires you to define an economy, which could be a domestic or international economy, and an industry. Make an estimate of the growth rate in the economy 
then consider whether the industry is likely to grow at a faster or slower growth rate than the average firm within the economy. For example, technology and healthcare are high growth industries. Coal mining and utilities are low growth industries. Finally, consider whether the firm you are going to value is likely to grow at a rate above or below the average of other firms in the industry. Does the firm have competitive advantage or good opportunities for investment? Then use your top-down analysis to help reach bottom-up conclusions on reinvestment rate and expected return on investment. If the firm is in a high growth industry and is a high growth firm within that industry, then there are good op investment opportunities which means high reinvestment rates and high returns on investment. Do not make two percentage growth assumptions, one from your top-down analysis and one from your bottom-up analysis. Use your top-down analysis to assist in making one growth assumption, which is the product of a reinvestment rate and expected return on investment. In the above discussion, I set a lower bound for reinvestment returns as equal to the weighted average cost of capital. As an upper bound, a re reasonable guide would be a nominal return of about 30%, and only for industries in which there are substantial expenditures which are classified as expenses, but are in substance investment. Let's say as a rule of thumb, that a return on investment range of the weighted average cost of capital to the weighted average cost of capital plus 20% is plausible, depending upon the economy, industry, and how expenditures are classified in the accounts. Under this assumption, the long-term growth rate for most firms in nominal terms will lie within the range of 1% to 6% at reinvestment rates of 20% to 60%. The lower bound is for a firm spending just enough on investments to grow cash flows at just under inflation. The upper bound is for a high growth firm. US GDP growth in recent years has been about 2% per year in real terms, and estimates of the CBOE are consistent with that number. If this continues and inflation is 1.5% to 2%, we can assume nominal GDP growth of 3.5% to 4%. So the midpoint of 3.5% nominal growth, halfway from 1% to 6%, is what you might expect for a typical mature firm. Let's summarise that in our valuation rules. A discounted cash flow valuation is an estimate of the present value of all expected cash flows. After an explicit forecast period, you need to think about cash flows in an abstract way because it becomes more challenging to say exactly how the firm is going to produce cash. Products and services change with technological advances. But the firm has developed inherent capabilities that allow it to continue for an extended period of time. One way to project cash flows in an abstract way is to assume constant growth. However, there is no requirement to project cash flows to grow at a constant rate. That is just one option, albeit a widely used option. Your task is to make the best estimate of cash flows. If constant growth gives you the best estimate, use it. If an alternative approach gives you the best estimate, use that alternative approach. The point in time at which you project a constant growth assumption has got nothing to do with the number of years for which executives or analysts provide forecasts. The number of years of projections depend upon the executives or analysts' confidence in making a projection, not the point at which you would project a firm is likely to reach a steady stage growth rate. Would you project Netflix or Facebook to reach constant growth in another two years? even if executives from those firms only gave you two years worth of projections? The market prices assets under the assumption that investments in capital will earn a return above the cost of capital. 
And this, because, this occurs because of imperfect competition, conservative investment decisions of executives, and conservative accounting conventions that lead to some investments being classified as expenses, which artificially lowers the reinvestment rate and increases the return on investment. In estimating long-term growth, you must consider growth from a top-down, that is economy, industry, firm perspective, and use this top-down perspective to assist in making specific assumptions from a bottom-up perspective, that is reinvestment rate and return on investment. Do not have two growth rates, bottom-up versus top-down. Have one growth rate from the bottom-up approach with inputs that are informed by your top-down analysis. I recommend you use the following rules of thumb for long-term growth rate assumptions, assuming inflation expectations of around 1.5% to 2%. These assumptions would be adjusted for lower or higher inflation. They are consistent with an economy growing at around about 2% in real terms and 35 to 4% in nominal terms a reinvestment rate of 20% to 60%, a return on capital equal to the weighted average cost of capital to an upper bound of the weighted average cost of capital plus 20%, and finally a long-term growth rate in nominal terms of 1% to 6%. Applying the equation for growth to the Kellogg case, consider the last forecast year. We have the following projections. Earnings before interest and tax of $2,020 million, depreciation of $500 million, capital expenditure of $600 million, sustaining capital expenditure of $500 million, and increase in working capital of $250 million. These assumptions mean that, after accounting for taxes and maintaining the assets in a zero growth state, there is $1,616 million available for distribution to the providers of capital. But not all of that money is distributed to the providers of capital. $350 million is put back into the firm for growth. $100 million on capital expenditure and $250 million on increase in working capital. And that gives us a reinvestment rate of 21.7%. For the purpose of the example, I'm going to assume a return on those reinvested cash flows of 8% and in conjunction with the reinvestment rate of 21.7%, that's gonna give us a long-term growth rate of 1.7%. Having compiled a set of expected cash flows, a discount rate, and an estimate of long-term growth, we are in a position to estimate the value of the firm and its equity after subtracting debt. Using our initial leverage assumption of 31%, which we're gonna revise, and the implied weighted average cost of capital of 5.24%, firm value is $33,990 million, which implies equity value of $25,097 million. Given the 341 million shares in issue, the implied equity value is $73.60 per share. Computations are presented in Table 4. The valuation of $34 billion for the firm and $25.1 billion for equity is not correct. The reason it is not correct is that there is an inconsistency in the leverage we assumed for computing the weighted average cost of capital, 31%, and the leverage that results from our valuation. Debt of $8,893 million on firm value of $33,990 million equals 26%. Our discount rate is too low because our leverage assumption is too high. So we have overestimated the value of the firm and its equity. Thankfully, there is an easy way to resolve this inconsistency. All we need to do is try different leverage inputs into the weighted average cost of capital until it is the same as the leverage that results from the valuation. Excel allows you to do this simply with goal seek, which we can demonstrate in class. Leverage of 27.4% results in consistency between the leverage used to estimate the weighted average cost of capital, which increases to 5.41%, and the leverage resulting from the valuation. 
with input leverage of 27.4%, firm value is estimated at $32.4 billion. Equity value is estimated at $23.6 billion, and equity value per share is $69.07. These computations are presented in Table 5. I want you to also consider dividend discount model valuation. Recall earlier that there has to be consistency between free cash flow to the firm valuation and dividend discount model valuation. The value of shares resulting from these two models will be identical. So as an alternative to our free cash flow to the firm valuation, we could have performed a dividend discount model valuation, which will give us exactly the same value for equity, provided we adopt a consistent set of assumptions. This means that the dividend projections have to be made on the same basis as the free cash flows. In our example, this means that dividends vary somewhat from year to year, because the dividends are what remains after the firm has paid its lenders, or drawn down new debt, and made investments. In reality, firms often adopt what is referred to as a progressive dividend policy. This means that they either maintain the dividend at the previous year's level, or increase the dividend. The intention of the executives is to present to the market a smooth, growing dividend stream. It is unclear why firms believe this is a sound dividend policy. It is unlikely to convince the market that the firm is less risky, because the market can easily observe that the dividends have low volatility purely because management chooses to have, have a low volatility dividend stream. The volatility of the firm's earnings will be unaffected. Further, it means that the firm has a higher reinvestment rate during boom periods and a lower reinvestment rate during recessions. This could be a sound investment policy if high future earnings are a signal of high future earnings, or a poor investment policy if high earnings are associated with unusually high valuations, so the market pays over the odds for new investments during boom periods. Regardless of whether the dividend stream varies with earnings or is smoothed by management, the important issue for valuation is that we compute cash flows for different valuation equations on a consistent basis. In short, we cannot simultaneously pay dividends and use the cash for investments. So we can either project the dividend stream and estimate free cash flows after making this projection, or project free cash flows and then estimate dividends. So I have constructed the dividend stream after adjusting the debt each year to reflect a constant capital structure. In our weighted average cost of capital, we assumed a consistent amount of leverage from one year to the next. If we estimate firm value in each year, we can adjust the amount of debt each year to ensure that leverage is constant over time. A common error made in practice is to assume high leverage in the discount rate, but when projecting cash flows, use surplus cash to pay down debt. So the discount rate reflects high leverage, but later year cash flows are consistent with an all equity finance firm. This means that the dividends in later years will be too high because there are not enough interest charges. So in projecting dividends, I have A, projected firm value each year using a free cash flow to the firm approach, B, estimated debt each year as 27.4% of firm value, C, computed the change in debt each year, and D, computed the dividend as net profit after tax plus depreciation, minus capital expenditure, plus change in debt. This results in the dividend stream and year-by-year -year valuations that are shown in Table 6. You will see that equity value that results from the dividend discount model is identical to the equity value that results from the free cash flow to the firm valuation. Something to note about growth rates for dividends. We mentioned earlier that in a state of constant long-term growth, the entire income statement will expand at the same growth rate. An implication of this is that dividends will grow at the same rate as free cash flows. 
We also mentioned that growth in free cash flows can be computed as the reinvestment rate for cash flows times the return on capital. For equity, the components of the growth rate equation are different, but the overall growth rate will be the same. For growth in equity, we compute the reinvestment rate for equity as one minus the dividend payout ratio times the expected return on equity. The reinvestment rate for equity will be lower than the reinvestment rate for the whole firm, and the return on equity will be higher than the return on capital. These differences will be offsetting, so we have the following equation. That growth equals the reinvestment rate for the firm times expected return on reinvested capital equals reinvestment rate for equity times expected return on reinvested equity. In our example, the reinvestment rate for the firm was 21.7% and the expected return on reinvested capital was 8%. So the estimated growth rate was 1.7%. If you consider year five from table six, you will see that net profit after tax is $1,452 million. The dividend is $1,262 million. So the dividend payout ratio is 87%, implying a reinvestment rate for equity of 13%. This occurs because there is enough funding from drawing down additional debt and sustaining capital being less than depreciation for all earnings to be returned to shareholders via dividends, or almost all earnings being returned to shareholders via dividends, 87% of them. Note that in reality, Kellogg returns cash to shareholders via dividends and by repurchasing shares. If shares are repurchased for a price, which represents the present value of expected dividends, and if there are no tax differences between dividends and capital gains, there is no difference to value, regardless of whether a company returns cash to shareholders via dividends or share repurchases. The reason companies use share repurchases is because for the majority of investors, there are tax advantages associated with capital gains versus dividends, and share repurchases lead to capital gains rather than dividend income. Finally, let's consider multiples valuation. We cover multiples valuation extensively later in the course, but I introduce it briefly here to contrast it with discounted cash flow valuation. Multiples valuation does not require explicit forecasts of all future cash flows and an associated discount rate. Instead, multiples valuation requires us to estimate an appropriate multiple to apply to a proxy for expected cash flows. So the assumptions about future expected cash flows and the discount rate are implicit in the selection of an appropriate multiple. This means that contrary to what is often stated in corporate finance practice, multiples valuation requires just as many assumptions as discounted cash flow valuation. They are just different assumptions. We can illustrate this with Kellogg and some multiples generated from firms with similar operations. Recall that we estimated the equity value of Kellogg at about $32 billion. The multiple of earnings before interest and tax based upon first year earnings is 18.1, and a multiple of first year earnings before interest, tax, depreciation and amortization is 14.2. Value relative to EBITDA is 14.2. Let's examine what our valuation estimate would have been if we had used some valuation multiples for similar firms. We will use EBITDA and EBIT multiples in this analysis, but there are additional multiples you can use and which we will cover in a later part of the course. The median value to first year forecast EBITDA is 11.9, and Kellogg's first year forecast EBITDA is $2,280 million. So if Kellogg was priced using the median value to EBITDA multiple of comparable firms, Kellogg would have a firm value of $27 billion. This also means the equity value of Kellogg would be about $18 billion after subtracting debt of approximately $9 billion. And the estimated equity value per share would be $53.49. We can repeat this process for a number of different valuation multiples. 
Across the multiples used in this example, the valuation estimates range from $49.82 per share to $66.92 per share, with an average valuation of $57.82 per share. To compile a multiples valuation, we need to apply multiples that reflect the growth prospects of the firm we are trying to value, as well as the risk of those cash flows. In practice, there are just as many contentious debates over selection of the appropriate multiple or the comparable firms used to estimate the multiple as those which underpin a discounted cash flow valuation. In addition, a common question is, what is the best multiple to use for a particular type of firm? For example, we could compile multiples of value to sales, value to EBITDA, or price to earnings, in which the price is share price and earnings is earnings per share. And we could compile multiples based upon one year, two years, or more years of forecasts, which will give us the most reliable valuation. You will probably arrive at the most reliable valuation by using all available information, which means computing the median or the, the average value from a large number of multiples based upon all forecasts that are available. The problem with trying to select one best multiple is the considerable estimation error in valuation associated with the benchmark multiple and the earnings forecasts. We want to minimise estimation error and the use of as much information as possible likely leads to offsetting valuation errors and in turn this minimises overall valuation error. One reason for offsetting valuation errors is that different multiples have strengths and weaknesses and we do not know in any particular situation which strengths or weaknesses have the most impact. Specifically, as we move further down the income statement from sales all the way down to earnings per share, the cash flow proxy is more relevant. Earnings per share is a more relevant proxy for cash flows than sales because it incorporates a profit margin and the effects of leverage via interest expense. So more relevance would suggest the use of a price earnings ratio for valuation. However, as we move up the income statement from earnings per share to sales, we have a more reliable proxy for cash flows. There is more estimation error at the lower end of the income statement because there are compounding errors of different layers of costs, more management discretion over accounting choices, and more potential for large write downs to distort the cash flow proxy. In computing a multiples valuation, it is crucial that the same construct is used in the numerator and denominator. Consider the multiples of value relative to sales, value relative to EBITDA, and value relative to EBIT. In each case, the value in the denominator is the value for the entire firm, or in other words, the value attributable to all providers of capital, normally debt holders and equity holders. And the cash flow proxy in the denominator is a measure of cash flows available to all providers of capital. So these are appropriate multiples. We have the same construct in the numerator and denominator. In contrast, the price earnings ratio and their market to book ratio. The market to book ratio in this instance is the market value of equity relative to the book value of equity. We have equity construct in the numerator and the denominator. You can also compute the market value of the firm, debt plus equity relative to the book value of assets. Again, we have the same construct in the numerator and the denominator. So those are appropriate multiples. Something like price to sales is not an appropriate multiple because it mixes equity value in the numerator with a cash flow proxy in the denominator that is appropriate for all providers of capital. The price to sales ratio became popular in 1999 when a number of loss making technology stocks went public because it is nonsensical to compute a multiple with negative earnings. In this case, most firms had no debt, so the distinction between firm value and equity value didn't matter. But we need to be clear that it is never appropriate to mix concepts of firm value and equity value in a multiple. 
If we do this, our analysis will be distorted purely because different firms finance their investments with different ratios of debt to equity. So let's summarize with another of our valuation rules. Multiples valuation is a useful technique and should be used in conjunction with discounted cash flow valuation for both intrinsic value and market value estimates. The benefit of multiples is that the price of similar assets is directly incorporated into the valuation. The limitation of multiples is that, is that the transaction prices are for assets that can be quite different to the asset you are attempting to value. So there is a trade-off between limited comparability and the direct link between traded prices and valuation estimates. Finally, I want to consider an alternative to your long-term constant growth rate assumption. Let's consider a constant dollar of reinvestment assumption. Here is another approach that you can take to long-term earnings and cash flow projections, aside from your typical constant growth assumption. In our valuation of Kellogg, we made the assumption that growth continues at a constant rate in perpetuity. In turn, this resulted from the assumption that the reinvestment rate and return on investment remained constant in perpetuity. We also noted that we do not necessarily need to assume constant growth in dividends. One alternative assumption is that rather than assume a constant proportion of earnings is reinvested in the firm, assume that the firm reinvests a constant dollar amount in new investments. The implication is that growth will decline over time because the dollars invested in new projects will be less each year as a proportion of earnings and cash flows. This assumption is not widely adopted in practice, but it could have merit in a number of cases. Under the constant percentage growth assumption, the implication is that the firm is able to find higher dollar amount of positive NPV projects every year in perpetuity. This will be challenging for mature firms. Under the assumption that a constant dollar amount of investments is made each year, there is a constraint on the size of positive net present value projects the firm is able to identify each year. It also means that the valuation will be less sensitive to the assumptions regarding long-term growth because a smaller proportion of value will be attributed to the terminal value. This is not the only alternative assumption you can make about long-term cash flow projections, but it is useful to think about it in comparison to the constant growth assumption. The valuation equation for equity under the constant dollar amount of investment assumption is presented in the table on the screen. The only difference is the computation of the terminal value. In the constant growth version of the dividend discount model, we said that the terminal value in year n was the dividends per share in year n plus 1 divided by the cost of equity minus the growth rate. If you change the assumption that the firm reinvests a constant dollar amount of earnings each year, rather than a constant percentage amount, the terminal value is computed using the expression highlighted in red. In Table 8, I compare the computation of the terminal value under the assumption that a constant proportion of earnings is reinvested each year, the normal constant growth assumption, to the assumption that a constant dollar amount of earnings is reinvested each year. The table shows the implied valuation for the Kellogg shares under the alternative assumptions. Equity value falls under the constant dollar reinvestment assumption because there will be fewer investments made in positive net present value projects. So as yet another of our valuation rules, we can say an alternative assumption to assuming that a constant percentage of earnings and cash flow is reinvested is to assume that the same dollars are reinvested each year. This assumption will lead to a declining growth rate over time because the percentage reinvestment rate will decline over time. This approach makes sense for a firm or industry that is losing market share relative to the industry or economy. Let's make some concluding comments. In practice, there is wide dispersion of the quality of valuation analysis and the interpretation of that analysis.
in terms of the quality evaluation analysis, a small number of carefully considered assumptions can materially improve the reliability of the valuation. This includes a consideration of exactly what concept of valuation is relevant, which leads to a consideration of the appropriate valuation techniques and data sources. It is not appropriate merely to say we perform the valuation analysis using a number of different techniques and based upon our judgment, the valuation is dot, dot, dot. Why were those appropriate techniques? On what basis did you give more consideration to one technique versus another? Importantly, discounted cash flow valuations can be performed a number of different ways, but the answer should be identical under technically correct modelling. In practice, it can be challenging to perform this modelling in a manner that is 100% technically correct. So it is understandable that small valuation differences can arise. A reasonable approach is probably to use an average valuation from different discounted cash flow techniques if your estimates are less than 10% apart. And so the average from two estimates would be not more than 5% from either valuation. But any discrepancy outside this range could mean that your valu final valuation is materially misstated, merely due to a computational error. This could well be the difference between a decision to invest or pass on a major investment. So for material differences in discounted cash for valuations, inconsistencies need to be resolved. You need to stress test your assumptions for discount rates and growth rates and beware of techniques that purport to reduce the number of assumptions required. Chances are that all this does is embed a series of implicit, that is hidden assumptions, rather than actually reduce the number of assumptions required. The most obvious example of implicit assumptions is with respect to growth. You cannot avoid making an assumption about cash flows in all forecast years and you cannot avoid making an assumption about returns on investment. So you may as well write them down so they can be debated. In terms of the interpretation of valuations, there can also be considerable misunderstanding of what the valuation represents. One particular weakness is interpretation is the idea that we should consider both a discounted cash flow valuation and near-term earnings metrics as alternative indicators of value. For example, a manager considers an acquisition on the basis of a discounted cash flow valuation plus a measure of near-term earnings growth. What this misses is that the valuation has already fully accounted for near-term earnings growth and long-term earnings growth and assigned appropriate weights to those benefits. Near-term cash flows have less discounting, so contribute more to the present value computation. Managers can be sceptical of discounted cash flow valuations because of the uncertainty associated with longer term cash flows. But the uncertainty associated with those longer term cash flows has already been accounted for because they are given less weight in discounting. If you then layer on top a further consideration of near term earnings, you are in fact implying a lower discount rate to near term cash flows and a higher discount rate to longer term cash flows. If that is the basis for decision making, then this should be made explicit and the assumption debated. Discount near term and long term cash flows at different rates. You will quickly see that this assumption is difficult to justify. Finally, it is often heard that valuation is an art, not a science, and this is not correct. There is nothing aesthetic or intangible about the valuation exercise. Valuation merely results from applying a set of assumptions to a process, typically via an equation like a discounted cash flow equation. There might be considerable debate about the correct assumptions to apply, but this debate is made with respect to theory and evidence, and not on the basis of the particular tastes of an individual. Whether art appeals to different individuals depends upon their preferences. If two analysts reach different valuations, we could always break down their valuation differences into the particular assumptions and processes relied upon in reaching those valuations.
Those assumptions and processes might not be explicit at the beginning of the exercise, but they are at least being made implicitly and can be teased out.